Chapter 20 of Mary, a Fiction. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joanna Harker. Mary, a Fiction by Mary Wollstonecraft. Chapter 20. The mate of the ship, who had heard her stir, came to offer her some refreshment, and she, who formerly received every offer of kindness or civility with pleasure, now shrunk away disgusted. Peevishly she desired him not to disturb her, but the words were hardly articulated when her heart smote her. She called him back and requested something to drink. After drinking it, fatigued by her mental exertions, she fell into a death-like slumber. It lasted some hours, but did not refresh her. On the contrary, she woke languid and stupid. The wind still continued contrary, a week, a dismal week, which she had struggled with her sorrows, and the struggle brought on a slow fever, which sometimes gave her false spirits. The winds then became very tempestuous, great deep was troubled, and all the passengers appalled. Mary then left her bed and went on deck to survey the contending elements. The scene accorded with her present state of her soul. She thought, in a few hours I may go home. The prisoner may be released. The vessel rose on a wave and descended into a yawning gulf. Not slower did her mounting soul return to earth, for, ah, her treasure and her heart was there. The squalls rattled amongst the sails, which were quickly taken down. The wind would then die away, and the wild, undirected waves rushed on every side with a tremendous roar. In a little vessel, in the midst of such a storm, she was not dismayed. She felt herself independent. Just then one of the crew perceived a signal of distress. By the help of a glass he could plainly discover a small vessel dismasted, drifted about, for the rudder had been broken by the violence of the storm. Mary's thoughts were now all engrossed by the crew on the brink of destruction. They bore down on the wreck. They reached it and hailed the trembling wretches. At the sound of the friendly greeting loud cries of tumultuous joy were mixed with the roaring of the waves. And with ecstatic transport they leaped on the shattered deck, launched their boat in a moment, and committed to themselves to the mercy of the sea. Stowed between two casks and leaning on a sail, she watched the boat, and when a wave intercepted it from her view, she ceased to breathe, or rather held her breath until it rose again. At last the boat arrived safe alongside the ship, and Mary caught the poor trembling wretches as they stumbled into it, and joined them in thanking that gracious being, who, though he had not thought fit to still the raging of the sea, had afforded them unexpected succour. Among the wretched crew was one poor woman, who fainted when she was hauled on board. Mary undressed her, and when she had recovered, and soothed her, left her to enjoy the rest she required to recruit her strength, which fear had quite exhausted. She returned again to view the angry deep, and when she gazed on its perturbed state, she thought of the being who rode on the wings of the wind, and stilled the noise of the sea, and the madness of the people. He could only speak peace to her troubled spirit. She grew more calm. The late transaction had gratified her benevolence, and stole her out of herself. One of the sailors happening to say to another that he believed the world was going to be at an end, this observation led her into a new train of thoughts. Some of Handel's sublime compositions occurred to her, and she sung them to the grand accompaniment. The Lord God omnipotent reigned, and would reign for ever and ever. Why then did she fear the sorrows that were passing away, when she knew that he would bind up the broken-hearted, and receive those who came out of the great tribulation? She retired to her cabin, and wrote in the little book that was now her only confidant. It was after midnight. At this solemn hour, the great day of judgment fills my thoughts, the day of retribution, when the secrets of all hearts will be revealed, when all worldly distinctions will fade away and no more be seen. I have not words to express the sublime images which the bare contemplation of this awful day raises in my mind. Then, indeed, the Lord Omnipotent will reign, and he will wipe the tearful eye and support the trembling heart. Yet a little while he hideth his face, and the dun shades of sorrow and the thick clouds of folly separate us from our God. But when the glad dawn of an eternal day breaks, we shall know even as we are known. 
Here we walk by faith and not by sight, and we have this alternative, either to enjoy the pleasures of life which are but for a season, or look forward to the prize of our high calling, and with fortitude and that wisdom which is from above, endeavour to bear the warfare of life. We know that many run the race, but he that striveth obtaineth the crown of victory. Our race is an arduous one. How many are betrayed by traitors lodged in their own breasts, who wear the garb of virtue, and are so near akin? We sigh to think they should ever lead into folly, and slide imperceptibly into vice. Surely anything like happiness is madness. Shall probationers of an hour presume to pluck the fruit of immortality before they have conquered death? It is guarded when the great day to which I allude arrives. The way will be opened. Ye dear delusions, gay deceits, farewell, and yet I cannot banish ye forever. Still does my painting soul push forward, and live in futurity, in the deep shades o'er which darkness hangs. I try to pierce the gloom, and find a resting place where my thirst of knowledge will be gratified, and my ardent affections find an object to fix them. Everything material must change. Happiness in this fluctuating principle is not compatible. Eternity, immateriality, and happiness, what are ye? How shall I grasp the mighty and fleeting conceptions ye create? After writing, serenely she delivered her soul into the hands of the Father of Spirits, and she slept in peace. End of chapter 20 Recording by Joanna Harker